Hey everyone, welcome back. Michael with Offshore Citizen. We are here in Bulgaria in this quarantine thing, which seems like day 10,000, uh, but it's really, you know, I don't know, maybe a month or something like that. And so relevant to today, I've been doing a bunch of videos on investing and I figured I would spend a little bit of time talking instead of about specifics about where we're at in the cycle of things or you know, what some specific opportunities are, instead backing up a little bit and talking about some of the fundamentals. And I, I've done some videos about this in some other forums uh, previously, but today we'll kind of cover a uh, general theory, which is the concept of predicting future price movements, okay? Because what is investing all about? Investing is all about, you know, buying something to hopefully have more in the future, right? That's really underlying what investing is all about. And there's more or less two ways that we can do that. The one is you buy something lower and then you sell it for higher, you know, theoretically if you're shorting, buy for higher, sell for lower, but we'll ignore that for a moment. Uh, the other is you buy something that produces some sort of cash flow for you over time and that cash flow adds up to enough that it makes up more than the total uh, and or you can sell and get an additional gain on top of that, okay? So if you're going to take on uh, either of those propositions, you need to have some way of looking to say, okay, what I'm paying today is worth it five years from now, 10 years from now, a year from now, whatever your timeline is, okay? And there's lots of different theories on how you do this. Uh, what we're gonna discuss today is not technical analysis, not technical trading. You can do very well doing that if you have the particular skills. But I think what's more applicable for a lot of people is making good decisions from what I'm gonna call a fundamental standpoint. That being said, it may not exactly fit into what some people call fundamental analysis. I sometimes refer to what I call underlying economics, and underlying economics differ from fundamental analysis, okay? So a little bit of technical jargon there. The important thing is that this should give you hopefully a framework to make good, what I would call risk-weighted decisions, okay? And this is the important thing to start off by understanding, is this concept of risk-weighted, because you can get lucky, okay? So in the short term, you can make any individual purchase or any individual investment, and you can get lucky on that investment. Over time, in theory, luck should get wiped out, right? So here's a simple example. Uh, investing works, you know, or if you're buying, let's just talk about stocks for today. If you're buying stocks, there's a binary set of options in terms of what can do, and I don't mean that by binary options trading, I don't mean at all to do with options. But what happens if I buy a stock? It can either go up or it can go down. I can buy or I can sell. That's it, that's what can happen. And this can give you the illusion of being quite good for a period of time, right? So consistency over time tends to give us insights into what actually works versus what doesn't work, all right? And, you know, very simple, it's just a coin flip model. Now, in practice, in stocks, in general, you will have more time that the market will spend going up than the market will spend going down. This further distorts your perception of how good you are, right? Because if the market, for example, spends 70% of its time going up and 30% of its time going down, and especially if you're willing to hold over a longer period of time, in general, you will tend to make money if you put money into the general stock market, okay? Doesn't mean that you will, but in general, that's going to be the case. Uh, just assuming that you just buy randomly and hold, okay? Uh, buying and selling in and out can cause you a lot of problems because psychologically, and I'll do another video on kind of some of the underlying psychology and how it'll screw you up, uh, you're gonna run into some issues, okay? So with that in mind, we're gonna buy and we have to have some sort of predictability. Now, let's just kind of go back to the thing about cash flow for a second. The problem, if you were to say, you know, put your money into, we're doing a deal right now for about, uh, quite a bit of money raising for, uh, for a, a company that does lending, it's purely you're getting the cash flow, right? So that's pretty easy to understand. When you're talking about a business, like a stock, the company might make a lot of profit, but they aren't necessarily paying that out. So very often it's common that companies have no dividends at all, or at least the dividends are quite low as a percentage of their total earnings, okay? So for example, maybe you can get, I don't know, two and a half percent or 2% or something on Apple stock. Well, that's a really low yield, right? That's barely above inflation. So in that case, you're reliant on the growth in value of the company. Whereas if you went and bought something that paid you, say 15% in cash flow, well, the majority of your profits are gonna come from that cash flow, and the, you wouldn't expect the underlying asset to go up that much in, uh, in price, okay? So, all right, 
Now, let's also realize, setting some context here, that what I'm going to talk about is uh, it's a perspective that is designed to be safe, that's built on a certain worldview. So what I often tell people is when you're investing, there's kind of two sides to investing. The first is what is your model of how the markets work, how pricing works, how prices move, okay? The second is you have technical execution, okay? And you can have a poor model and still make money if your execution is good, or you can lose money if your execution is bad, even when your model is good. Okay, so that is super, super important. That's things like, you know, how do you choose your entries? How do you choose your exits? What do you set your stop losses at? Et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a bunch of different factors in there. How do you do your position sizing? Maybe we'll do a video on that at some point in time. But anyway, those things all are important to pay attention to, but they're not what we're gonna talk about today. Today we're just gonna talk about what is that model of how prices work, okay? And this, by the way, is kind of a Warren Buffett-esque type model, but with a few variations, okay? So the underlying idea is that a given asset has a different given value, okay? So, you know, you go and buy a Ford car, the value of that car is different than the value of a Lamborghini, okay? And so the price is not the same thing as the value. You have to start by, this is kind of an underlying idea of value investing, right? Is there's a difference between price and, there's a difference, and value. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. That's kind of the Ben Graham, Warren Buffett explanation, okay? So no matter what I pay for that Lamborghini, I'm still getting the same Lamborghini. No matter what I pay for the Ford car, I'm still getting the same Ford car. But there's a fundamental difference. If I pay the Ford car price for the Lamborghini, that's different than paying the Lamborghini price for the Ford car because there's a different value there, okay? So hopefully that makes sense to you. Over a longer period of time, you will tend to find that the price returns to the value. So the price will have a lot of volatility and it will vary quite a bit around the value for a lot of different reasons, right? Now the value might also be changing, right? Just like you buy that car over time, the car is depreciating in price. The more it is that you use it, or typically, once I have a collector's car that'll go up, but generally speaking, over time, the value of a car is declining, which is what makes a car a bad investment, right? By contrast, if you buy a property in some place where the utilization is going up and the demand for that property in that particular region is going up, then the value is going up over time, right? Again, the price could do all kinds of things in the short term, but the value is going to correct to that. So you need to kind of realize this, okay? So if I spend too much on something whose value is going down, there's a good chance that I'm gonna get screwed. This was generally the problem in any sort of bubble, right? Is that, yeah, maybe it's going up really fast, right? Say you bought Bitcoin in mid 2017, right? You might've made a lot of money by it going up, right? If you bought tulips during the tulip bubble, you know, you could have made a lot of money by it going up. Does that mean that you made a good investment decision? No, not particularly. You might have made a good technical trade, right? And again, you can certainly make money off that. It's certainly perfectly reasonable if you can do it predictably. But doing it on a consistent basis is what we talk about with respect to risk reward, right? With risk weighting. So what we're talking about here is how do you do well factor pulling out the luck? right? Pulling out those weird anomalies that maybe you're lucky enough to catch them, maybe you're even smart enough to catch them. We want to say, hey, look, we got did well not because we were lucky, but because we were good, okay? That's basically the idea here. Okay, so you have price, you have value, very important. Over time, you know that the price will return to the value. Now, that might take a long period of time, okay? But generally, I find that if it is far down, the amount of time it will take to come back to the value is much shorter than the amount of time it can be much higher than the value, if that makes sense, okay? In other words, a common thing that people tend to get wrong is that bull markets tend to go on longer than you expect, okay? Bear markets, a lot less so. Often they, we're having this conversation right now, you know, the market dropped very rapidly. There's a lot of people who are sitting there saying, no, it's gonna go down, jobless claims are going up, businesses are going bankrupt, things like this. You know, we'll see, we'll see what actually happens. But fundamentally, it's very, very important to realize because you can get caught on this, that bull markets can very often last longer than you think. You'll hear the people who had a good fundamental position, for example, uh, very famous investor, I'm trying to remember what his name, anyway, uh, he sold out in like, 1998 or something on the dot-com booms, well, it didn't peak until much later, right? He thought it was insane, sold out, quote-unquote, early, right? 
uh, the people in Bitcoin, right? A lot of people, myself included back then, uh, was saying, hey, this is insane in mid-2017, and it continued to go on for months afterwards. Uh, even this last, you know, basically from the period of 2009 until 2019, you know, valuations were already high, and they kept going up, you know, quite a bit after that point in time. Okay, this tends to be what's going on. Right now, I would say the big one to call out is there's a lot of people saying, hey, we're getting all this debt, the debt, there has to be some sort of a recompense that happens through this. But the reality is we can push that farther than people think. If you watch the movie, The Big Short, it was something similar with the housing bubble, right? With the housing bubble, a lot of people were saying, hey, you know, by 2006, 2007, things should be collapsing. They didn't collapse until much later. Why is that? Well, in general, these things, they tend to be able to push them further than you would expect. So be aware of that when you're making your decisions of where to enter, okay? All right, so this brings us to the question fundamentally of, okay, where, how do we know what things are gonna be worth, right? And I'm gonna give you, I guess I would say three different ways of looking at it, okay? And not all these three things uh, necessarily have to be aligned, etc. but if you apply them all, generally you're gonna be okay. So the first one is historical, okay? How has it been doing historically? And this, I'm looking a lot at this right now because if something has been priced consistently very high and consistently going up, then if it drops a lot, then you know you have a reasonable chance of returning to fairly high levels. And so we can look at this in terms of moving averages. Now, some people look at say 200 day moving averages, 50 day moving averages, et cetera. I would typically look at much, much longer than that. I would look at one year charts, two year charts, five year charts, and then say, hey, what's the average point that we've got here? If we see, that it's consistently much higher than it is today, well then there's a good chance that it's gonna to return to being much higher than it was today. Make sense? So, you know, you could pretty easily simply draw a line and say, okay, I'm looking at the chart, I'm gonna ballpark this. You don't have to do some sort of fancy technical analysis. You can get an idea. Now, in some cases, it's gone parabolic, in which case that data is mostly useless, okay? Uh, in other cases, you'll see there's some particular reason why it's knocked off of there. Again, you know, that can throw your numbers off a little bit, but usually if you look at a sufficiently large amount of data, uh, there tends to be patterns in terms of the historic pricing of a company or an asset, okay? What's number two? Number two is you're gonna pay attention to the value in terms of uh, how much money it's making, okay? How much money it's making is a little bit tricky, okay? This, again, you should look within the context of historicals, all right? Uh, because companies will lose money for a very long time and still continue to go up in value or up in price, you know, actually go up in value as well. And so it's a little bit tough to look at. And it's especially tough if you don't understand how to read financial statements. So I'll give you a specific example. A few years ago, Twitter looked quite bad from a profit standpoint. Their profits were quite low. Okay, and if you were just looking at that, you would say, hey, look, you know, the stock hasn't done well, profits are low, things are bad, it's not a good buy. Well, it turned out if you dug deeper, what you would find that although that was true, that profit was down, free cash flow was quite good, okay? And free cash flow happened to provide a pretty good indicator of what was going on. You could dig into their financials and find that it was, you know, executive-based compensation, options, things like this that were holding it down. And given the circumstances, that was not very sustainable, so it was likely that you were gonna see profits. And that's exactly what happened, okay? So learning to read deeper into financial statements is useful, that being said, uh, and I'll, I'll do a whole video on risk at some point in the future, but it's really, really important to note that if something goes bad and a company is losing money, it may never recover from what is going bad, okay? Losing money is risky. Making money is inherently good for you. So we talked before about, hey, you buy this car, let's say I overpaid for the Lamborghini and now I'm driving it, I'll probably never recover my money, okay? If on the other hand, I overpay slightly for something that is increasing in uh, price or in value, then over time I can still recoup my money, okay? So buying things that are productive, that are producing profit, generally reduces your risk. And now this brings us to the third part, which kind of factors into uh, the, this middle part of the amount, right? The amount of like, what are we talking about here when we're talking about profits, making cash, right? Because ultimately that's what you're going for. You're going for something that's gonna become, it's gonna have more in terms of assets and it's gonna be producing more because that's ultimately the profits of a company 
become the profits of the shareholders, okay? Okay, so how do we know what that number is? Because I can tell you, you can go and look at Facebook and see that they're trading on a 30 times multiple, right? Or approximately that, whatever. Uh, so 30, meaning that more or less that's a 33-ish, uh, sorry, 3.3% return on your investment, just from a profit to stock price ratio, okay? So we'd measure this by earnings per share divided by the uh, stock price, or you know, you could say profits over market cap, okay? So, uh, or the other way around, sorry, market cap over, uh, over anyway. Uh, so, so you go and you say, all right, well, let's say this company is making $10 billion a year in profit, right? And they are trading for a $300 billion market cap, okay? So that's a 30 times multiple, all right? Then you've got a bank that, say, is making $10 billion in profit, but they're trading for $100 billion. So which of those is a better deal? If you purely look on the surface at the profits, then the bank is clearly the better deal. But I can tell you the bank's multiple is not likely ever to come up to the level of that tech company, which is at the 30 times. It's possible that 30 times one will go down, that's possible, but not likely to be the other way. So what you have to do is you have to look at the comparables, okay? What are other companies in that space trading for? How do they compare on the fundamental numbers? Because not all businesses are equally comparable across the board. Some are in a fast growth industry, some are in a low growth industry. Some have really good return on equity, some have poor return on equity. Some have great profit margins, others don't have great profit margins. Some are very debt based, others aren't debt based, and so on and so forth. One way or another, you somehow have to figure out how these go. The important thing is to note, okay, if it's at this level, okay, if its profits are stable and it drops a lot, it will tend to return to that level, okay? May, and as the profits go up, the price should go up as follows, okay? Now, it may go up past there, it may come up and come down, it may, you know, it'll go all over the place. But pay attention to the profits, okay? Uh, and the ratio between the profits and the price. This is like one of the biggest things people get wrong. I'll do a whole video on what people get wrong. But that's one of the biggest things, okay? Number two, uh, historical. How are we compared to the historicals? If the historic price is going down, and even if the price dropped a lot, if it continues to go down, I may not get a lot of upside. I talked about this in a previous video, okay? Very, very important to realize. If it's going up, and I don't mean going up as in an unsustained boom driven by debt and investor speculation and hype. In that case, you know, it may collapse, right? So for example, that was what happened in the cannabis industry uh, over the last couple of years. That was what happened in the crypto bubble, right? You had all this massive uptrend, and if you bought, you might have said, hey, I'm getting this cryptocurrency at a 10% discount, well, it could drop 30% in a day. So it means nothing, right? It means nothing. So if you want to see like sustainable growth, if you have sustainable growth over time, then if the price goes down, it should tend to come up to the level it was at before and probably above. If you have sustainable losses, you know, over a long period of time, we're losing out, the company is shrinking, then it's probably not going to recover very well. If it's fairly stable, then we're gonna probably tend towards returning there in general, okay? And the way that you know that, you're gonna look at the historical data in terms of what was the chart, the uh, was price over time. You're gonna look at what was the growth of the company and earnings over time. What was the consistent ratio that you had over time? And how is the industry and in this comparing in general compared to the industry, okay? So this is kind of like your first mental model, is just to understand, okay, there is price and there is value, and over the long period of time, prices will tend to return to the value. So either that if you have a very high price relative to the value, the value needs to go up very, very fast in order to meet that point. Now, you could sell out before that happens, so uh, if the value is not growing sim at a similar rate to the price, you're gonna have a problem. Your returns are going to tend to be lower, okay? If the value is going up faster than the price, then generally that's gonna work in your favor. If the value is going down and the price is not, you know, you're gonna have a problem. If the price is not going down faster than there, you're gonna have a problem. But generally, I would say avoid the things that are going down unless they're extremely oversold and you have some sort of a technical insight in terms of how to play that as a short-term trade, okay? So that's like the basic introduction for today. I'll do, you know, like I said, some other things uh, in future videos, but hopefully that helps you out. Again, if you have questions, reach out, write something in the comments, email us, go onto the website. If you wanna book a call, go and do that and uh, subscribe to the channel and we will see you guys on the next video.